an already very interesting Grand Prix calendar. OK, John, more from you later. And, and they're running with a Ford Cosworth power plant, which they say weighs a staggering 100 kilos less. McLaren may be under pressure, but Honda have promised them a more powerful version of their V10 engine for this race. As he revealed to us here on Eurosport at the French Grand Prix, Alain Prost has confirmed that he will be retiring from Formula One at the end of next season. This is the halfway stage in the season and the time when the pre-qualifying is reassessed. The lucky team are LaRousse who move forward to qualifying proper. The unlucky ones, Ligier. Let's have a look at how they fared in that very early morning session. Ligier were making their debut in this cutthroat forerunner to the competition proper. The French outfit showed little evidence of the blow to their morale, Philippe Alliot qualifying fastest in 1 minute 45.513 and teammate Nicola Larini restored more Gallic pride when he posted the second fastest time of the early morning session. The third place in the official practice sessions went to Olivier Griard, who maintained his impressive record in the lower cellar. Last to move up a grade, Yannick Dalmas, who made up the teammate Gabriele Tarquini's failure to join the top flight. So, Philip Alio, quickest in the session, he's no stranger to pre-qualifying, he had to do it last year. I asked him how the car was handling early in the morning. Well, the car was not too bad because I finished first, but uh, the problem is the pre-qualifying. Pre-qualifying is something, you know, very, very difficult, but also very exciting for the driver. Because uh, uh, if you miss this pre-qualifying, if you have the, just a small trouble, you are dead and uh, the weekend is finished for you and that's why this pre-qualifying are something very very exciting and all okay it was the first time for the team here to be in pre-qualifying not the first time for me because i was in pre-qualifying last year with uh, la Rousse. and uh, it everything was perfect today all the mechanical all the people was very good very good and uh, you know, it's not very easy to be to be quiet in, in this uh, house, and uh, also no problem for me because I was first in the beginning to the end, and uh, now it's finished and I'm I'm happy. What did it mean to the team having to pre-qualify? Uh, for the team, it's really big trouble. First, because you are completely at the back, like. Uh, the, if you are not in Formula One, you know, you are not considerate. And uh, for that, sometimes it's really difficult because all the first team have the nice box, everything, and you, you are with your truck completely at the exit and uh, with the other. That's the first difficult thing to support. The second is um, all the um, organization is different because you have one hour more and you need to change many, many things. And for example here, uh, we put uh, many bikes around the track because during this hour, if you have just a little trouble with the car and you are stopped completely at the exit, here is seven kilometers and it's impossible to come back. And it's uh, a different organization, you know, but uh, I'm happy and surprised because the team did very, very well for the first time in pre-qualifying today. I hope it will be like this till the end. Not such a happy session for Coloni with their new engine. It may be lighter and prove more reliable, but there's still that matter of fate to deal with. As driver Bertrand Gascher negotiated the first corner and got it all wrong. That put pay to their chances of getting through pre-qualifying. Another man with problems in pre-qualifying, Brazilian Roberto Moreno. His Euro brand left the track at the same point. If anything, a more dramatic exit. It hasn't been the happiest of German Grand Prix for Moreno. He missed the first half hour of the session when his car was completely rewired. So quickest among the pre-qualifiers, Philip... Well, engine, that's the V10 Honda. And at a circuit like Hockenheim, which is a power circuit, that should see them get onto the rostrum. But of course, Ferrari, Williams with the Renault engine, and now Benetton with the Ford engine are becoming very serious and strong challengers. 
So I think we're going to see possibly an even better race than we've seen in the last three. They were crackers. I can't wait until Sunday. Neither can I. Lots to look forward to. We'll be back right after... 90 mile an hour barrier. It's very long straight, so now we've got a very heavy braking down into second gear. Very slow through here, and it's really important to get the power on and uh, really avoid the kind of sliding we saw back into the Lotus doing, and up into fifth gear again. Back into sixth, the, the second of the straights. And uh, about five years ago, we had another chicane added to the circuit. This one is at the Ost corner again. Quicker one than the previous chicane at the fourth gear corner. Quick exit, the car running out by, out to the left-hand side. Now on the third of these four straights, coming back towards the stadium. Again, up around 190 miles an hour. This is the quickest of the three chicanes. In fourth gear again. Quick change of direction, then up the curve a little bit. It's hard to avoid doing that on the quick lap and qualifying tyres. It's probably slightly quicker to let the car ride up the curve, but not let the whole car get across the curve. Now, on the final straight into this stadium, quick fourth gear corner again, using every bit of the road. Now into third gear for this very tight and very demanding sax curve. Into fourth gear. This is the part of the circuit really that in the past didn't make any difference to the performance because it was really only one speed through here. But now with the aerodynamics and cars, it's becoming a really important part of the circuit. 145.396, the fourth fastest time so far, and an amazing lap at over 150 miles an hour. But here's the big threat. Ayrton Senna starting uh, his warm-up to a really fast lap, and this is a real artist at work, John. Well, Ayrton Senna, as we know, is the master of these qualifying laps, but in the last few races, Alan, he hasn't been on full position, and uh, he's been worried about it, McLaren are worried about it. They've been working absolutely flat out to find the reasons for the car's sort of, I might call it, lack of performance. They know that the Honda engine is really brilliant, but uh, the car itself isn't working, but See, let's see if Senna can do anything today that's going to redress that past three-race drought the McLaren team have been suffering from. When Senna gets things right, really, it's fantastic to watch. And just saw coming out of that chicane, the way he is able to use his car. And again, through there, he's so clean and neat. And it's really that ability. He's got something very special that I don't see any other driver matching. He can get through those chicanes. He's not bumping over the curbs the way others are doing but he's maximizing the use of the car, the engine, and of course these qualifying tires, and they're only good for one lap, remember. And again, they're almost perfect for that. I couldn't say anything wrong with that at all. So let's have a look and see. We've got Ron Dennis in the little box looking at it. Fairly unemotional look in his face, but Senna probably on the best lap he's had so far during the, the proceedings of the German Grand Prix. Coming back up now to the, near the end of that lap. This final double right-hand corner onto the straight. And it's a 140.198. That's unbelievable. That's incredible. And it was just about as perfect a lap as you could get. 151.744 miles an hour. And that is really going to take some beating this weekend. It's way under their testing times. It's way under anything that's ever been done at Hockenheim here. There's Berger waiting to go out, and he really has a challenge on his hands now. And indeed, uh, of course, it's putting it up to the Ferraris as well. Here's Prost uh, starting his lap, uh, Alain Prost, and uh, the Ferraris very quick in pre-circuit uh, testing here. Well, Ferrari have been quick everywhere this year, and uh, particularly the last three races. Prost is absolutely ebullient at the minute. He's, his confidence is back to the level we saw maybe two or three years ago. Certainly, since he left McLaren, he's a different man, a rejuvenated racing driver. And right now, he is getting the most anybody can out of his Ferrari. So the action coming hot and heavy here. It's that tremendous time of Senegs he's got to beat. At one minute, 40.198, 151 miles an hour. And that really is quite a challenge. But if anyone can do it, Prost can do it. Senna now being reversed back into the garage. It's not a sort of thing there's going to be great waving and leaping about at the McLaren pits. They're not that type of people, but they must be certainly proud of their Brazilian driver right now. That was an incredible lap. Well, Edmund Senna's out of his car and uh, totally unemotional about all the whole proceedings. But here's a man who is an emotional racing driver, Nigel Mansell. And it's really quite late in the session for Nigel to go out. 
So we're going to have to watch and see if he can match the performance of Alan Prost. The first time, of course, Nigel's in a Ferrari since he announced his intention to retire from Grand Prix racing at the end of this season. And I'm not certain whether that was the smartest thing he could have done, mainly because he's now driving, I would say, on borrowed time. And with all the pressures that are existing within the team and the pressure he in particular is feeling, I'm not sure whether he would have been better to at least keep those intentions more secret and to himself and waited until maybe the end of the season and then said, well, I've had enough. I'm not going to drive any more in Formula One. I'm going to go back to the Isle of Man and spend a lot more time with my wife and children. And uh, it's a decision, I think, that he made principally to give every, everybody else around him an opportunity to sort themselves out. But in these competitive days, I think uh, you really have to think of yourself and put those pressures behind you. Because the other big question, John, is is motivation going to be there? And looking at these pictures, it certainly looks there at the moment. That's vintage Mansell stuff. He's doing a very, very quick lap here indeed. Whether the Ferrari can catch this startling lap put in by Senna earlier is a very big question, but certainly Mansell's having a mighty try. Well, he doesn't seem to have lost any of his enthusiasm, that's for sure. I mean, he's over the curbs trying to extract the maximum. Yes, well, that's not a bad thing, that curb. The exit of that chicane, it doesn't really matter. I can excuse anybody for running over that curb. But other ones, certainly, you get up and the car loses aerodynamic downforce, and that loses time. So let's have a look at him coming into the stadium, this very fast fourth gear, right-hand corner, dropping the left rear wheel off the track, and those shower of sparks are from the skid plates underneath the car. This is the very twiddly part of the infield circuit. Back into fourth gear for this double right-hand corner. The car gets light over that. And then the second part tightens up. And then now it's powering onto the start-finish line. Let's have a look at the time, Alan. Just waiting for it. It's 142.32, another 150-mile-an-hour lap, which makes him third quickest so far. So an excellent effort there indeed. So we've still got uh, Berger now going out uh, again shortly. There he is, Berger, on his warm-up. And uh, he's a man that can, of course, produce another sensational lap. Uh, but the big question is, can he match Sanna? And remember that time, 140.19. Inside Donnelly's car, coming up on Berger. Well, that was a nasty... Look at Martin, absolutely furious. Because Berger was on that slow out lap. Martin was on a quick lap. He tried to get around him. And uh, he was very lucky not to collide. That was a, an error on the part of Berger and not anticipating the closing speed of, uh, of Donnelly's Lotus. But now Berger quietly getting on with the qualifying job in hand. He's going out now on his qualifying lap, running a little bit wide, but again, in that corner, it can be excused. It didn't, didn't have a very quick lap. But it's such a small margin you're talking about. You're talking about tenths, even hundredths of seconds in those very, very tight parts of the circuit. But they add up at the end of a lap. Now coming into this second chicane again. Well, not bad. Not, again, quite so clean as center, but still pretty good. Staying off the left-hand curb a lot. Other people try to shortcut it and bounce the car across that. And I think in the end of the day, they lose time. Now we're coming into this third chicane, which is really the quickest of the three. And entering, getting the car through there. Yes, well, that was pretty good. So, all together, I think this is going to be a reasonable lap from Gerhard Berger. Let's just have a look and see how he gets into the stadium. This fourth gear corner is coming into now. Know, dropping the back of the car again off the circuit. Most people are doing that. A little bit quicker. If you can get the power on, it's probably quicker to let it drop down. Coming into this very tight section of the circuit again. And now back onto the start-finish line. Glad out. And Berger, in fact, was the quickest car across the start-finish line in the morning warm-up session. So uh, certainly that corner he seems to be getting correct. You said a reasonable lap, it certainly was. At 1 minute 40.43, another 150 mile an hour lap, and there's somebody in big trouble, Nanini. Here we see the replay. Well, just as we saw a red flag just at the end of Berger's lap, but that is an almighty shunt from Nanini in the Benetton Ford. And I'm not really quite sure what he did, because he came into the corner, it looked very normal, and all of a sudden the car just swapped ends and went backwards into that tower wall. And that is a very, very sad looking Benetton. I don't think that car will be running this weekend. Well, we've got a red flag out now. Practice is going to be stopped to clear away the mess at that third chicane. Of course, going in backwards has probably done a lot of damage to the gearbox, and there's oil all over the track. But Gerhard Berger sitting in his car, having a, another moment's rest, waiting to 
get back out in the circuit, Edmund Senna as well. Of course, the circuit is now closed. The marshals are out cleaning up the mess, and uh, it'll take a few more minutes for the track to be ready to go again. And we were just about half distance, just a little over half distance through the session, and the situation there was uh, both the McLarens were leading. Uh, Senna had a 1 minute 40.19, then Berger was second, Prost was third, Nigel Mansell fourth, Piquet fifth, and this is Alessi, the sixth place man who's in big trouble. Well, that is an almighty blow up. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what to say, but that is the internals of the engine have all come out the exhaust pipe, most of it in steam. And of course, the marshals very efficient. Well, they love to play with their fire extinguishers. I mean, they are there for real fires. There's no danger of the car catching fire. They just can't resist having a, giving it a little bit of a burst on the back of the car. Alessi is saying, take it away, take it away. All you're going to do is make a mess. That blow up really was just steam. There was very little oil. So I imagine something like a piston has collapsed and gone through the cylinder liner. And the water has just come out the exhaust pipe. And that was what caused the steam. So, uh, sad day for Alessi because he was very, very impressive indeed. Uh, and of course, for Brian Hart, who builds the engines for Tyrrell, a big disappointment. And Gregor Foytek going through the second chicane, and I think really that's an example of how not to do it. He got the car, it started to bounce, he went over the curb on the inside, started to bounce, car got out of control, sliding across the curb, and uh, that's a fairly good illustration of how not to take that second chicane. So Ron Dennis looking uh, for Senna to go out for another lap. Um, it's going to be pretty sensational if it, if it can possibly match the first one. 151 miles an hour, the target broken here this afternoon at Hockenheim by both the McLarens and Senna is uh, just building up to another massive attack on this one. Uh, obviously traffic very important to get a clear run and indeed he's dealing with it very well at the moment. One of the advantages at Hockenheim is because it's such a large circuit, such a long circuit, you can get away with the traffic much more easily than on some of the more tight uh, and shorter circuits. So traffic tends not to be such a big problem, but of course, and inevitably, you'll find, well, here, just look now, Senna's got two cars in front of him, but they're both going slowly, and he's able to thread his way through. Now we're approaching again this quick third chicane in left, right, and, and the fair, oh, well, that sort of, let's say, didn't get the best out of the chicane that time and in fact I would think he's going to abort the lap because really uh, any chance of improving has been completely lost. Yes, Senna's now slowed down and he decided to come in but now we're back with Nigel Mansell into the first chicane trying to get out of it as cleanly as possible. The seven-speed gearbox in the Ferrari of course being semi-automatic there's two little levers in each side of the steering column so he flicks a lever to change gear not a conventional gear change as all the other cars have down into the second chicane, over the curb, a bit more boundary that time than the first time. And fifth gear, sixth gear, and up to seventh gear, passing one of the Leighton houses going.